Hi everyone, this is uh, Howard Mann. Welcome to the SDR webinar. Who would like to start this week? Travis, do you want to just get organized before you start? David, do you want to start? I can start. All right, let me just get to the control panel. I'll give you the screen right now. You should see it. Okay, can we see a radiograph? Good, where you do. Okay, this is um, an older woman who has a hiatal hernia and has this mass adjacent to the mediastinum up here. We have another plain film picture of it here. Again, it looks like a lung mass. Um, and she did have a CT scan. And let me show you what this turns out to be here on CT. I thought this would be a, a lung mass. Um, We'll look at it first in this in this projection. Um, way up here, you can see that she's got this extremely tortuous right brachiocephalic artery, which is actually border forming on the mediastinum. So I think I have a uh, coronal projection of this, which shows this extreme buckling of this right brachiocephalic artery up here. So yeah. this I thought was a lung lesion, is a really exaggerated example of right brachiocephalic artery pseudotumor, which typically causes modest widening of the upper mediastinum above the level of the aortic arch, um, look, looking enough like a mass uh, to confuse you. But this is a really extreme example where this buckling makes it actually look like more like a lung lesion to me. So I thought this was a, a lung tumor, not a mediastinal tumor, but it's a um, pseudotumor and it's this right brachiocephalic artery misbehaving like this. So the typical right brachiocephalic artery pseudotumor is in an older person whose aorta is elongated and the arch is elevated. And the elevation of the arch pushes up the floor under the right brachiocephalic artery and forces it to buckle like this. The vessel also becomes tortuous with age. So it's usually in the, accompanied by age and a elongated, elevated aortic arch that causes modest mediastinal widening up here. This is extreme mediastinal widening so much so that it looks like a lung lesion. So right brachiocephalic artery pseudotumor. Very nice. And uh, this is one of the cases that I uh, I sent to yeah. um, Arun to. So you may have seen this case in the last couple of weeks. Okay, and then this, this man has myelofibrosis. You can see there's some sclerosis of his bones. He has um, therefore reduced uh, immune capacity. And let's see if I can show you another exam on him. Um, then he developed this diffuse fine nodular lung disease here. And let me show you the earlier images on him. So he went from having that radiograph with clear lungs but low lung volume to having all of these nodules throughout. And there's some larger nodules here in the right base. So, you know, um, with this fine nodular pattern, everybody's concerned about TB, uh, that was my first consideration. And so he's got a bunch of lung nodules. They're random throughout the lungs. There are some that are very peripheral along the edges, implying that they might be bloodborne. And we get down into the bases, here we have these much larger nodules down here. And, um, you know, the lung just doesn't look that bothered around these big nodules down here. So I thought, you know, if this were TB, we should have more sort of sogginess of the lung, more inflammation of the lung around these nodules. So, um, you know, they made me wonder about whether this is really TB. And, you know, they looked at sputum and they looked at lavage and stuff like that, and nothing grew for uh, a period of time. So what do you think this turns out to be? What does it look like to you guys? Some sort of cancer? Yeah, I would think with these smooth nodules in the bases and the lung looking fairly normal around them that uh, this could be metastatic something or other. Yeah, that's what I was concerned about. Okay, Howard, do you have any any clues? Uh, just give us the, the context again. I was, I was distracted by something technical here. Okay, myelofibrosis, myelofibrosis. Uh, reduced immune capacity, and then sudden onset of nodular uh, lung disease. We went from a normal, normal radiograph, I think from August to in October having nodule city that's, all over the place. That's pretty fast for cancer then. Yeah. Um, it's, 
myelofibrosis, treatment of myelofibrosis. The, um, the cases of medullary, of, of extramedullary metapoiesis we've seen in the lung haven't really been this nodular either, but I guess that's possible. And that fat, I mean, that's really fast too. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Fun something fungal, something granulomatous. Yeah. I, I don't know. Do some of the larger nodules have patent airways within them, make, making us perhaps think of a some form of lymphoproliferative process? Yeah, I was wondering about that too. Uh, I would have thought, you know, could this be something with lymphocytes? Because that can show up very rapidly and it's basal yeah. predominant and often nodular. So I, I had a whole bunch of things in mind and then it grew out MTB. Hmm. And, and then in two weeks, he died of MTB. So he's one of the 25% of people with miliary tuberculosis that couldn't, can't, can't be saved. And um, this is a later radiograph on him showing that this stuff was not going away. This is a few weeks out now. Uh, still has the larger nodules in the bases. And he's got now lower, lower lung volume. And then uh, he died, I think, about two days after this. So... Um, it was uh, it was TB, which was the top of our list at the beginning. I I wasn't quite um, confident about that because of those smooth, larger basal nodules than I've seen in TB before, and the lack of uh, lung irritation by all of it. So, um, you know, common things are common, and this was miliary TB. So, there you go. Wow. Okay, wow. those are my my two cases. Great. Wow. All right. Seth, would you, do you have cases for this week? Yeah, I have some cases. Great. It's coming your way. Trying to show this. Let's see. Uh, I don't know. Is this, is this look too, can you see my big screen or does it look all screwed up on your guy's computer? Um, it's, we can see your big screen. Okay. So this is a really, this is one of the cooler cases I've seen, and I have radiographs to go along with this, but I just there's so many CTs, as you can see, that it's hard to do this. So this is a young woman who showed up um, at our CTEF center many, uh, God, almost, however, 2005, 13, 14 years ago. And, you know, she didn't have CTEF, and, uh, you know, I've been fortunate that in being here for a year, I've seen more cases of... Um, interesting things that cause pulmonary hypertension that I've seen anywhere else. And uh, there are here some few, a little bit of septal thickening, you know, some few faint nodules. Uh, and, you know, she was excluded for CTEF. The thought was that this was some other form of pulmonary hypertension, uh, which was confirmed she got a lung transplant. Now, interestingly, she got a unilateral lung right lung transplant, which confirmed the diagnosis of uh, pulmonary capillary mangiomatosis. Now, what's interesting here is not necessarily, there's two things interesting. One is seeing the natural progression of uh, pulmonary capillary mangiomatosis over, you know, 13 years of which the patient would have died well before, um, you know, it would have looked like this because she wouldn't have survived with the pulmonary hypertension. And you can see uh, over three years and then five years later, four years later, you start developing this more kind of classic septal thickening and ground glass opacity, not a lot of nodularity. And then eventually over time, I mean, literally just turns into this crazy paving pattern, this confluent crazy paving pattern. And which is just presumably um, end stage pulmonary capillary mangiomatosis. Again, we, we don't see that because it's just you wouldn't survive. Now, the other interesting thing is that over the time, over the years, there's also been interval development for of these nodules here and septal thickening in the right lung. And she underwent biopsy of the right lung, which showed recurrent pulmonary capillary mangiomatosis in the transplanted lung. Mm. And this is actually known to occur. It's extraordinarily rare. Um, just A, to get, have, have this disease, let alone have a, a lung transplant for it and to live this long, but she's literally getting PCH in the right lung. So it is, some people call it, I, I mean, I don't know enough about the pathology, but I know some of the basics, but some people consider it almost to be a low-grade malignancy. I don't know if that's true or not, 
But I think this is just a fascinating case, seeing the end stage of a disease we never see in one lung and then the recurrence in the other. Um, so that that's one of the favorite cases yeah. I've had this year. One comment I oh. make about that that's kind of interesting is that uh, we've known for some time that you can see the pathology of pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis and pulmonary venoocclusive disease yeah, it's, in the same person, it's both. same lung. Yeah, it's I think there's some both. pathologists that say that that believe that the pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis is an epiphenomenon of the entity of pulmonary venoocclusive disease, and no one understands it very well. But if it's some kind of crazy clonal process or some pathologic process in which you get pulmonary venoocclusive disease and then some kind of reactive pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis, then um, that's why it looks the way it does and why it may... This I agree. Yeah. I mean, this one to me, if I if I had to choose between the two looking at it, I, I would say PVOD. Um, but uh, there are cases, and we have seen cases here that, uh, and, and the pathologists never look through the entire lung, but um, they have enough experience here in these cases. And we, we have had a couple, and I'll show you a, coming up another case of something where um, they specifically mentioned that in their specimens that um, initially that they only saw PCH, they didn't see PVOD. And we know that it's either a spectrum or one precedes the other, that a lot of people kind of put them in the same bucket um, and that this is a post-capillary, supposedly the PCH is a post-capillary phenomenon, whereas uh, the PVOD is obviously at the level of the vein. But I, I agree, Howard, I'm sure if when this, so what the cool thing is and what I'm hoping is that she's back on the lung transplant list to get a, a transplant of the left lung. And I would love to, you know, make sure they do excellent gross imaging and detailed pathology of this left lung to see what exactly it is. Because it be it would just I don't know just be an interesting case. What was the rationale for doing single versus bilateral have, lung transplant? No, just I, to, no idea. I have no idea. That's a right next, heart function. I have no idea why they decided to do unilateral versus bilateral. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just what's available, or I, I don't know the the reasoning for that. That's an awesome case. Hmm. Very interesting. And yeah, and I'll show you. I mean, we have chest X rays going. You know. Just if you, I'll just pull up the chest X right now. That what she looks like is just this very interesting pattern. And uh, I'll, I'll show. I have chest X ray going back years, and I've sent them to you. See, I've included a bunch of those. Um, this is an interesting case, and I'd like to get your guys' opinions on this because this is, I think, quite interesting. One second. Uh, I don't know if this will work. Let's see. So this is a young kid with um, AML, and you can see he has this, uh, let's see which studies are which. So here's his first study, and he has this multiloculated cyst and in the anteromediastinum. And at this time, he has relatively fulminant disease. He has these very... I mean, if I, if I had to choose, I would say lymphoma, but whatever, lymphoma leukemic, these very classic peribronchiolar uh, areas of nodular consolidation, some areas of ground glass opacity, you know, this and this was known to be secondary biopsy proven to his lymphoproliferative disease. And he has bone marrow that's positive. In addition, he has this very weird complex cystic structure in the anterior mediastinum. And when his disease became a little more fulminant in terms of his pulmonary manifestations actually got worse, he started developing this nodule along this, uh, whatever you want to call this cyst, or there was a not, there was a little septations here. I mean, I wouldn't call this a simple cyst to start for various reasons. I mean, it's got multiple septations. There's vessels coursing through the, it through it. It just does not look like a simple thymic cyst or, and then he got treated and um, the cystic portion that, or sorry, the, the nodule resolved, the pulmonary manifestations got better. Um, I know it's hard to put them side by side, but trust me, they got better. And then the, he underwent a surgery for this thing to take out, because we said that it's concerning for um, some form of lymphomatous involvement. And you can see the septations and the vessels running through this thing. And interestingly, when it came out, it was read as a... Um, 
you know, a simple cyst, which a thymic cyst, A, I, I don't buy that for various reasons, but, and we're going to, I'm going to review it tonight in pathology conference, but in talking, and I, in talking to our pathologists here, they said that these multi-loculated, first of all, it's covered by squamous epithelium. It's not covered by, there's no thymic cells in those cysts. So they said that, but they said that in some of these um, acute lymphoprolifer diseases, it's not uncommon to get these multi-loculated cysts and see tumor involvement in them. I, I don't know what else to say about it. It's just an interesting case of a kid with AML with this complex multi-loculated cyst who developed some form of uh, presumably tumor when his lung was worse within the within this this complex cystic structure. So, right. so uh, how much did they resect it? They, they took out this whole mediastinal mass, not just the little uh, bud on the side there. Is no, they right? said they supposedly went an entire resection of the entire thing. And, and, but, and but, it had a squamous lining. What 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 sort of cell type? I mean, what would it be the source of a squamous lining? I don't know. Okay, I have no idea. And that's what and because they called it a thymic cyst, and I I have to say, I, pathologists here, I'm a little sometimes I question them. They they call <laughs> You know, they, they have a. They describe a bronchogenic cystic anterior mediastinum covered by respiratory epithelium, blah blah blah, and they say it's a thymic cyst because it's in the region of the thymus because it's in the anterior mediastinum. Um, and I've called them up a couple times, said that's not what it makes a thymic cyst. A thymic cyst, from my basic understanding, it's the epithelium that covers it. And they're like, yeah, kind of. But anyways, yeah, um, gonna, I'm going to ask another question. Was this? You said at first I thought that this was AML, and then you're talking about lymphoproliferative disease. Was this? Oh, sorry, a AML. Oh, sorry, it's it's leukemia. What kind? AML or ALL? I have to look it up. I thought it was AML. Maybe it's ALL. Okay. I, I, I don't know. The, honestly, I don't know what the difference would be in terms of imaging manifestations unless you know something specifically that's the difference between the two. Well, I mean, it, you know, if this is AML, then this could be a chloroma that, we're, that you're seeing up here. You know, um, you can get, depending on the, they used to have a, this uh, designation of M4 and M5 disease. Those tended to have a, a um, macrophage component to them, and they would often form chloromas or granulocytic sarcomas. Um, and so this could be that, uh, especially the little bud thing that, that popped yeah. off. So if this is, uh, but if this is, um, if it's an ALL, then you would say, well, maybe this is a small cell, a small uh, lymphocytic um, sarcoma. I mean, it's actually lymphoma with a, you know, along with the, um, the lymphocytic leukemia. So the, the kind of leukemia matters and yeah, um, yeah. unfortunately, I don't, I think you guys, if I could look it up real quick, but I think you guys would be able to see my entire screen and I don't want to pull a patient's name. I can let you know, um, okay. after, when, after, after someone goes, I can fill you in, but, uh, okay. and, oh, this is just a nice case talking about, um, other diseases. So here you go, Howard, right? This looks very similar to the last case I just showed. Um, what? Huh. So this is PVOD. Oh. Um, so this is a case that was brought to CTEF conference for okay. rule out chronic thromboembolic disease. Actually, let me, let me back up. We are not 100% sure that this is PVOD or PCH, but the patient is a young, young woman who has all the findings that you would expect with PCH, PVOD, and she is um, now on the, I think, undergoing on the transplant list, or they're going to consider it for transplant. Yeah. But, it's you know, a very, image. very classic appearance. Um, you know, severe, severe pulmonary hypertension, no thromboembolic disease, very characteristic pattern. So that was another yeah. case, but they, that one's not path proven. And then lastly, I won't waste... Uh, I'll send over the pictures in case anyone ever has a paper or presentation on the imaging manifestations of mucopolysaccharidoses. Oui. So this is a patient with Morchio syndrome and Morchio syndrome is known to develop this very robust and I have a gated aorta and gated cardiac study so you can actually see the motion. They get this really robust um, aortic stenosis. And so this is a young woman with Morchio syndrome and I'm it, that has this just pronounced aortic stenosis. Nothing much exciting about that except that she has this uh, 
is mucopolysaccharidosis. What's the big lesion in the right hemithorax there? Oh, that's just, um, that just the liver. liver. I'm in a weird, I was in a weird plane to show the aortic valve. Okay. And she has, I mean, she has, I mean, I don't know what to make of her lung disease. I mean, I just called it just airway disease, but she has, you know, lungs are not completely normal for a 30 year old. Yeah. Um, and she's a non-smoker. So, and we know that in a lot of diseases, you get pulmonary manifestations, um, but that's not, we don't know what's going on with her lung, but those are my cases. Is well, any of it from birth? Was she prolonged hospitalization? That's good. Like, that's a good like thought. Some I mean, pulmonary dysplasia. I guess it doesn't look typical for some of the cases that we see. There's not a lot of air trapping, but I guess that's one thought. Yeah, I honestly, I don't have a lot of information on her. This is a study from a couple of years ago where I just came up with a follow-up chest X-ray and looked up her history. And there's nice. not much from her birth or anything like that. All right. Those are my great. Thank you. Okay, Howard. I'm okay. ready to show some. Travis, great. There you go. Okay, do you see my screen? Good. Now, I'll go full screen. Let's see if that helps with the jumping around. This is you know, a variant of, of something that we've seen in the iatrogenesis realm. And this is a kind of a, an interesting one because I haven't seen this particular abnormality before. But this is a patient who had a CT in August. And I'll just show you really quick. He's had a prior heart transplant 15 years ago or so. So you can see that's why his left atrium is so large because they've piggybacked the transplanted atrium onto his, onto his native left atrium and pulmonary veins. He'd also, prior to the heart transplant, so 20 years ago or something, had a right-sided thoracotomy for some biopsy not otherwise specified. But for years now, he's had intermittent right-sided chest pain and upper abdominal pain. And on this study, this was a PE study, and you can see he has this peculiar little thing here, and it's like mixed soft tissue and fat. If you notice, it looks contiguous with this rib space, yep. and, and it's, there's some proliferation, maybe even some inflammation of the extra pleural fat, and he's got small effusions. And I'll show you just one comparison from 2016 next to this. Now we'll see if this jumps or not. Tell me if this jumps, Howard. Um, your jumping is very modest. Okay. 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 Well, so we'll go to the one in 2016. And now you can see that that bump isn't there. There is a little bit of, of fat. But I don't have all of the old studies, but you can see there's a little clip there from where his surgery was. But anyway, even looking back further, one of my colleague, Kim, had gone back. And even in 2015, 2014, that same little bump had been present and had been intermittently coming and going. Oh. So she thought that this was probably some sort of intermittent hernia of chest wall. So instead of the typical lung herniating out that we see, that this was chest wall herniating in. And... What's really interesting is that a couple months before this study, he had undergone a cholecystectomy for what they thought was chronic cholecystitis. It turns out his gallbladder was basically normal. So the theory is that he had, that he was like having at least some degree of ischemia or incarceration from this. And this was a month later. This is the one where it was finally all put together and, and they suggested that this was probably the cause of his pain. And so they went in and found a, a, like a five centimeter long defect in this intercostal space from the old thoracotomy and excised about five centimeters of tissue that was inflamed and probably from ischemia. So this, I haven't really seen a case where we have a defect where stuff herniates more in than out. We never saw one where there was lung herniating out, but I thought this was pretty interesting. Okay. So they... Um, yeah, they, they, whatever this hernia sac that they called it, they excised it and it was just inflamed. Wow. So. That is very interesting. You can almost see a muscle, but as, as some muscle yeah. drawn exactly. in. Exactly. Like some, some latissimus there. On this exam, yeah, on this particular yeah. one. Oh, that is so interesting. Yeah, and it had been, you know, it had been commented on on several studies in the past, dating back for years, but 
I guess he had only had symptoms more recently and, and you know, I, while they said there was some mild chronic cholecystitis, I wonder if this was the cause of his pain all along and it was just referred or, you know, to that area. Hmm. You know, it, uh, it, it makes sense that you should have <coughs> herniation in this direction given the negative pleural pressure. Basically, this uh, this muscle tissue got sucked in. That's and true. Yeah, more so than what we typically see, right? With the right. yeah. Well, now speaking of things I have not seen, this is an absolutely crazy vascular case. So this is 2013, 50 year old man. He has hepatitis B, and he underwent a liver ultrasound to screening for cirrhosis. And I'll scroll down. And they noticed a big network of collaterals around his, a, a, around his liver, as you see here. And this prompted further evaluation and eventual referral for what was diagnosed as an arteriovenous malformation of his right lung. And I will just scroll through, you know, just to give you a sense of how many enormous collaterals they are, or how many dilated and tortuous vessels there are that go into his right lung. And you can see his right internal mammary artery is huge. He's got enormous bronchial arteries on this side. And then he has these large collaterals here, like, uh, I guess, you know, you can call them whatever you want. Some of them are coming from the phrenics. Some of them are coming from the renal arteries, from the intercostal arteries. But what was really interesting, he was referred to the interventionalist to treat what they thought was a pulmonary arterial venous malformation. And I'll show you the, the cath, because I saw a follow-up that I'll, I'll show you in a moment. But when I was looking back at this, because when I saw it, it was only a non-contrast study. But if you look at some of these, that as they cross the pleura into the lung, that some of these vessels, if, when you see them, they never really, there are never really macroscopic communications between arteries and veins. And like take this one, for example, right here, that loops around into this vessel, joins up with this vessel right here, this vessel, that these are all actually arteries. These aren't pulmonary veins. And so this is a systemic to pulmonary arterial, arteriolar fistula, which is bizarre. I couldn't find any of these that, that actually communicated with pulmonary veins. And I think at first they thought this was a big a, a pulmonary, there was systemic artery to pulmonary vein fistula just because the right pulmonary vein was so dilated, but it makes sense even if it's communicating with the pulmonary arteries that the vein has to be dilated too to accommodate it. And of course his left ventricle is dilated at this time from high output as well. So, and I'll show you the, the angio. This also confirms these aren't pulmonary arteriovenous malformations. What's really, I think, interesting about this is if you see the pulmonary angiogram that on these images here, notice there's a relative paucity of flow in the periphery, in the lower lobe, which I think is probably competitive flow because if you think about the arterial pressures, just like that last case with David talking about pressure, and I'll show you on subsequent images, the flow from those systemic arteries is actually back into the pulmonary arteries, which I think is why these areas aren't really opacifying with pulmonary arterial blood as quickly as everything else is. And you can see there's no macroscopic pulmonary AVMs. And I'll show you, here is the, the uh, arteriogram that they did. You can see they've got a catheter. I think this was in the intercost or in the internal mammary artery. Look at this huge thing. Look at all of these collaterals. And then the first thing that you'll see that opacifies is some of the pulmonary arterial tree right here, rather than pulmonary venous blood, showing that these are actually macroscopic arterial to arterial fish, uh, communications. That's remarkable. So what so, do you think is this, Travis? What 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 is the mechanism for this? And it's just on the right side, correct? It's not. Yeah, it's just in the right lower lobe. Well, that's that was going to be my question for you guys. I mean, I don't know. He's. I'll, I've got. Let me show you one other image because this is what we did last week. So I had a, a little bit of fun with this. Unfortunately, it was being scanned at a different at a different site where I couldn't be on on hand. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to have basically a, a saline flush, which which they kind of screwed up. But 
Anyway, I wanted to have an arteriogram of the systemic arteries timed with a flush through the pulmonary arteries so that you could see the flow of high dense contrast into the pulmonary artery. But I think even though you can still see that here, that with the timing, there's a little bit less contrast in the pulmonary arteries. And you can see how bright the right pulmonary artery is relative to the left, which I think is indicative of these of the, the, the direction of the shunt. But in terms of your question, David, I have, I don't know. This patient, by one theory, patient has signs of old tuberculosis. He's not from, you know, he's not from this country originally. So I have no idea if he could have had a prior infection and empyema that caused inflammation and caused these to recruit if this is congenital. I have no idea. But the issue, the other issue is that the interventionalist doesn't know what to do to treat him right now. You can see his LV is dilated, like I mentioned before. He doesn't really have many symptoms yet, but the fear is that he'll end up with high output heart failure. And the question is, what the heck do you embolize? Like they can try and embolize the internal mammary artery or some of these intercostals, but he's just going to develop more collaterals. Um, so I have no idea. I, I don't know. I mean, we've seen obviously small systemic to our pulmonary collaterals, but nothing like this. Mm. At least I haven't. So, so he said he had TB, he had hepatitis B. He has uh, hepatitis B, yeah, it doesn't have cirrhosis. His liver it? looks reasonable. But it yeah. must be it must be post inflammatory because it's localized to the right side, even though he doesn't have gross pleural thickening. I've seen I've seen, uh, I saw a man with, uh, who'd had a pneumothorax and a hemothorax as part of that, who developed a lot of systemic arterialization of his right lung. And a lot of it was driving blood flow retrograde into pulmonary arteries, but there were also pulmonary venous connections too, coming from intercostal and other chest wall arteries. So, um, you know, his, his irritation was caused by the hemothorax following the spontaneous pneumothorax. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's, you know, he didn't have a lot of pleural thickening. So I think anything that irritates the pleura can set this up. The fact that it's just on the one side. Yeah. Maybe the case, I was just wondering if his hepatitis B might have inflamed his pleural space on that side and not, and spared the other side because of the liver being on the right. Um, but yeah, I don't know, but you think if it were liver disease that were driving this, it would be, it would be bilateral. So yeah, it's very, yeah. It's very strange. He doesn't have rib fractures or anything, does he? Uh, did, I didn't he... see any. And in, in fact, I don't have a radiograph, but I was even looking for rib notching. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. But but if they're, I think, yeah, it's not a pulmonary arteriovenous malformation. It's systemic to pulmonary arterial fistula, I guess, would be the appropriate term. And th what this would be a uh, left to right shunt, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and high output too, with the especially, you know, the amount of blood that's going into that that will, I guess, only worsen over time. But so it's probably it's probably his remote TB. I did. I guess that's the most compact uh, okay. explanation is that he had that was yeah that triggered enough pleural inflammation to create this. That was my theory. Yeah. So. Yep. That's All true. right. Yeah. This one, I'm I'm curious on your input on this case. This is a 65 year old man and the imaging, so you can see he has emphysema. I think what's really striking about this is that he has what looks like bullous emphysema and it's strikingly posterior in its distribution. So you can see that it's really the posterior portions of the lower lobes and the upper lobes. Now, you know, even airspace enlargement with fibrosis, maybe a little bit of this, that's a good distribution for that. The reason this was being done, he's got a little bit of paraceptal emphysema there. The reason this was being done was that to follow this nodule from outside, and you can see this whole thing is calcified and has been unchanged. I have one other outside study, but he was referred for evaluation of that. Uh, this is the old study, it's thicker images, which is why I didn't show it, but it, I think it shows the abnormality actually even better. Now, what's interesting about him, he's 65. He was a tobacco user for a while, quit 30 years ago or something, but has been 
a lifelong marijuana smoker and only he started when he was about 20 and only recently quit within the last few months when he started feeling worse. And so the, my question, could this be a form of like a giant bullous emphysema with just a weird distribution or what do you think? Or do you think this is just airspace enlargement with fibrosis? Maybe it's the latter just because um, it's the most satisfactory explanation if he's a smoker. The distribution like is odd. Um, yeah. You know, that one case that showed a lot more fibrosis. I mean, this just looks like. Yeah, it's true. Ocular emphysema. I mean, I, and I know it's not a classic alpha one and trips in but um, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I mean, the other case you showed looked fibrotic. Right. And lobular emphysema. I mean, I'm sure there's fibrosis pathologically. But, you know, like, it doesn't look like the other case. I don't know. It's just so weird with the, how dependent it is. And again, we're not going to get into the aspiration discussion because I don't think this is aspiration, but you know, they're just like we were having to talk about when things are so dependent, it's weird. That is peculiar. Hmm. But yeah, I don't know. Cause there's still like the, his whole long history of marijuana use always you know, makes me wonder <laughs> just with this weak association with giant bullous emphysema. If, I don't know, but I just wanted to throw that one out there just as a curiosity. And then this is kind of just a fun case because it's a something we don't always or we rarely see anymore. And, and this was one yesterday. It's more of a thought case. But this is a guy you can see he's 37 years old, PE study. He's a couple days post-op and the, the operative history does come into play here in a moment. And he's just got the usual post-op dependent atelectasis. And of course, he has a little bit of thymic hyperplasia. And it's a good example of thymic hyperplasia just because it drapes over the anterior mediastinum. There's no mass effect to it. There's no convex margins. You know, you can measure it, you know, whatever, less than 1.3 centimeters. It should be after your age 20. I mean, I think that in any 37 year old normal person, this just looks like it's a little too much. So this just begged the question of why he has this, which is the interesting part. And, you know, just going through with my residents and my fellow, the differential on what causes this. And certainly stress from surgery or whatever can cause this. But the fact that he's only like one or two days post-op wouldn't, you know, really cause that. And the reason he had surgery was we looked this up and I'll show you that he has a little pituitary macroadenoma right here. And his whole story is that he has recently been diagnosed with acromegaly. And so that brought up the question, can growth hormone cause thymic hyperplasia? Because that was my theory of what this might be. And sure enough, I've been able to find some, some uh, literature on it. So thymic hyperplasia in a child treated with growth hormone. So of course this would be just growth hormone replacement, but it's a nice discussion, you know, that, that, there's been lots of studies that show that growth hormone does have a, a pro-thymic effect or growth-promoting effect on the thymus. And there was actually a much older case of acromegaly, a case report that I found that's listed here from like the 70s in a patient that had thymic hyperplasia and acromegaly. So I think this is, you know, we never see acromegaly, but I think this is the, ex the explanation for this patient's thymic hyperplasia. So just okay. a little fun. Yeah, it's a fun case. We added to yeah. a list of, um, of Graves' disease and thymic hyperplasia. I never thought of growth hormone, so that's really interesting. Yeah. What's, what's kind of interesting about this case is they actually have histology. So this was this, this pediatric patient after treatment with growth hormone, and they were kind of aggressive because they biopsied it. I don't know if they thought the patient had leukemia or, or what, but obviously, you know, sometimes we see patients referred in for possible lymphoma when they just have thymic hyperplasia, but you can add growth hormone to your differential for thymic hyperplasia now. So. Very. <laughs> wow. Wow. All right, Howard, I'll stop there. I have another one, but I, I want to leave you a little bit of time. All right. I'll show you guys a couple cases. Here. 
I'll put that off to the side. So this is uh, really quite interesting. So this is a case of, and I'll show you some more detailed history in a moment, but basically in summary, this is a person that came to our hospital having had a history of recent hospitalization in the context of trauma. And he had chest trauma. He had, by description, broken ribs. But the intervention that he had at the outside hospital in the context of trauma was an abdominal intervention. And after that was done, he was let go. And then he developed or had continuing chest discomfort, so came here. So let me show you the... Okay. I'll put these two alongside, so if you were reading this in the context of yeah, I read chest trauma, here is the frontal, you'll see he's got pleural fluid. I can see rib fractures on the frontal projection, but here is, I'll give you a moment just to look at the lateral projection. So look at this as you would in a patient with a history of breathing chest trauma, but otherwise he's, he's up and about. And see if you see anything interesting. So amazing. It's like now, so much better. What I'll do is I'll blow up the area of interest. Is there something retrosternal? There's a weird convexity there. Yep. So that's one observation. So there is. An oh, it looks. Oh, there. you can actually see this. The sternomanubrial joint looks dislocated, doesn't it? Now you see that. Exactly. So here is his incomplete board assigned from a hematoma. And then, sure enough, and I've never seen this before. But here's the manubrium, and here is body of sternum. Exactly right. So let me just bring in the, the sag. And sure enough, <laughs> there. So that's really quite unusual. We see sternal fractures and manubrial fractures all the time. But this yeah. kind of complete dissociation is really, I don't think I've seen one before that I can recall is quite interesting. So there's a whole description of of this entity, which is really quite unusual. And you can see the That's different impressive. kinds of joints that you may have, but dislocation like this is really unusual because you have very strong supporting ligaments or other structures that keep the manubrium and the sternum close together. So you can have one type in which the sternum is gone posteriorly with respect to the manubrium like this one, and the type 2 in which manubrium is dislocated posteriorly with respect to sternum. So has, that's really interesting, isn't it? That's quite, wow. a, quite a thing, isn't it? I've never seen that before. Yeah. I've what never have, seen it. Yeah, I've never seen that either. Um, you know, I've seen sternal fractures before. It seems to me if you push on the sternum, why would it choose to dissociate at that at that joint so cleanly like that? It's yeah, it's very clean. Must have been hit really hard on the body of the sternum, yeah. or and then pushing it back, and then the maneuver. yeah. You almost wonder if there had to be some sort of distracting force too. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree with David. It seems like the bone would break first. Yeah, yeah. And you can see they just basically put the two together with a, I guess it's titanium uh, plate screws, fix that up. Interesting. I'm lucky to see that again. Was, was that just a hemothorax on the left, that pleural effusion? I presume so. I presume okay. it was a hemothorax from fractures. He came in with that from the outside. This one, uh, David will like in particular. Um, we've seen this before, but because this one is such a nice example of it, I'll show it to you. So we look at the bones over here. I'll give you a moment to look at the frontal projection, and then we'll zoom in a bit to the clavicles, and we'll see this really nice subperiosteal bone absorption on the undersurface of the outer clavicles. Missing bone right there. Mm -hmm. And we go to the frontal projection of the chest, and there is a subtle finding here. So let me just, in the interest of time, bring in the bigger version of it, which is this lesion down here. 
really super typical for a brown tumor. And here is what you would like to see. It's shown pretty dramatically, rugged jersey spine. So renal osteodystrophy. And of course, with so much abnormality in bones, it's not gonna be just localized to the chest. It's going to be everywhere. It's going to involve the pelvis in all the usual locations. It's going to involve the hands and the phalanges in the usual locations. <clears throat> I presume what's in the finger here, I presume, is a brown tumor. No. And then the super typical subperiosteal bone resorption. So a really nice chest imaging case, well, body imaging case, but nice, really nice chest findings. This is a beautiful case. Wow. Yeah. Was there, is that cardiomegaly or pericardial effusion, by the way? Uh, let's have a look. I think that it's just a big part at this point in time in that context. I don't see pericardial fluid. He actually had another brown tumor of an anterior rib, which I couldn't see in that radiograph. I couldn't remember where it was. Oh, here we go, right there. Look at that. So he's got at least two nice rib brown tumors. This is the most dramatic case I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. That's really... It's yeah. very a nice teaching case of that. All right. Let me uh, conclude with another interesting case. So the context here is the discovery of a nodule, an unanticipated discovery of a nodule, in a follow-up exam in a patient with spheroderma. So they image periodically to evaluate patients as we know for lung disease, but the unanticipated finding, now I have to go and find it, is a new nodule. We had other nodules that were unchanged, but a new nodule showed up and I need to find it. So here we go, that's in July. So he didn't have this nodule before. And I went shooting by it. So I have to find it, there it is. Okay, so here is the new item right there. It's not calcified. It uh, rather nondescript, it's got slightly lobulated margins. I was trying to decide whether it had a small airway in its most inferior portion, but probably not, or maybe yes. So I will tell you that, of course, they were concerned about a new nodule. Could it be a cancer? Here is a pet, and I hope this shows up properly, if I can. Because it's not visible on the on the fused images. Let's see if I can make this go in the right direction. Sorry, let me try and make it. I don't know why my thing is doing this. Okay, suffice it to say that when I got to the chest, I could barely see this thing. And at most, the amount of FTG avidity associated with this was not appreciably more than mediastinal blood pool. So it's not going to show up very well here. In the interest of time, I'm not going to try and find it. But at the most, this little dot here was about the same as mediastinal blood pool. So not very FTG avid. But a new finding over a period of months. But they took it out, of course. And I'm going to show you a really nice description on the part of our pathologist. This turns out to be a, you go up. Um, an inflammatory pseudotumor of lung. And this particular one had morphologic features consistent with the so-called lymphoplasmacytic type of inflammatory pseudotumor. You can see how interestingly that there was an elevated IgG4 to IgG ratio, but this patient does have any other features of IgG4 related disease. So this is just the development of this pseudotumor of lung in a relatively old person. So just uh, to put this in some context, um, this is one classification of the inflammatory pseudotumors. And now we know that some of these lesions are truly neoplastic. So there, one in particular that is really a clonal neoplasm is the inflammatory 
myofibroblastic tumor, at least those that are ALK positive. And we typically see those in young people. And there's strong lines of evidence to indicate that that form of inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor is a clonal neoplasm. And then, of course, the other ones are described by virtue of what the dominant finding is. So the classic one in the pediatric age group, other than the IMTs, is the plasma cell granuloma, the lymphoplasmacytic, and now some of them are associated with IgG4. So here's a really nice article if you want to read about that um, called pulmonary pseudoneoplasms. They, they describe very nicely and have this table of the inflammatory pseudotumors of lung. So, Howard, this was in the context you said of... Uh, scleroderma, just an une un unexplained finding. The scleroderma, okay. And the... The pathologist mentioned in her report that that some people think that it may be associated with autoimmune processes, as you can see here. I'm not familiar with that, and there's no reference for this potential association between this pseudotumor lymphoplasmacytic and some autoimmune processes. One of the pathological differences, it might be hard for a pathologist to separate out a nodule that turns out to be an IgG4-related thing. But typically with an IgG4-related pseudonodule, they typically have a very distinctive pattern of what they call storiform fibrosis. And typically the pathologists look for a thrombophlebitis. Those two pathologies are typical of IgG4-related disease. Um, rather than this form of inflammatory pseudotumor per se. But you can see that they, the pathologist was thinking about that, as you can see there. So kind of interesting, don't know what to make of it, but it's not a tumor. And why this person developed this, of course we don't know, but, but pretty interesting though. Very interesting. Yeah. All right, that will do it. Thanks, we had a lot of really, really great cases. Even 